Hello, everybody. Welcome to a uh, another road reflection that we're doing, and we're actually doing it on the road. Uh, this is uh, we're going back to the old classic, how it was done before the world was exploded into fire. Uh, I had to see a friend of mine um, who has a painting for me, and I haven't seen her in fuck seven months uh so we're gonna go to a park and get a little takeout um you know to be be safe and just distant stuff like that so headed out to do that um so i figure since i have a bit of a drive i can do uh, uh, a nice road reflection for you guys go back to the old classic format of the of the road reflections uh, where I sit in my car, driving down the highway, and uh, and and yell about uh, yell about some politics stuff, uh, and boy, do we have things to yell about. Uh, <laughs> but before we dive into these, uh, into I really only have one topic uh, for this video today, um, but it, but you know it, it's it's a big one, it's a heavy, it, not a heavy one, but it it it, it delves into a couple different things. Um, or and hopefully it'll be uh, engaging and interesting enough for you guys. Um, one of the things that I do want to mention up at the top of the show is that uh, website's getting updated. Um, that's going to be the one-stop shop for all things Fish Mohan. So past episodes of Road Reflections, uh, past episodes of Fork Full of Noodles, and uh, Taboo Table Talk, the Dispatches. Those are all going to be available directly on my website which is krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, you can uh, very easily get tickets to upcoming shows there. Uh, the next one is August 28th. It's going to be the next regularly scheduled Citizen Revolution show, so you can grab your tickets directly off of my website. Um couple things in regards to that as well. Uh, each week it's a new show. Uh, that means it's a, there's a lot of work that's put into these shows and I'm the only employee of that show, uh, which means that I'm doing all the research, all the writing, all the editing, all the graphics, all the video editing, the clips, um, and, then, and then performing the show in and of itself. So it takes me a full week to get all of that stuff prepared uh, and then do the show, um, and then once that show is done and recorded, I take that and, and they become episodes of Fork Full of Noodles. Uh, some of you guys that regularly watch this channel probably already know this information. Uh, so that's a lot of work. Usually ends up with me, um, you know, Mondays and Tuesdays are, are, are sort of the long days of um, getting a lot of the foundation done for the show and, and, and try to get ahead on... Um, you know, uh, getting Taboo Table Talk up and ready to go for Thursday, and uh, so usually on Mondays and Tuesdays, I'm like working between I don't know eight, eight and twelve hours a day for the day. Like it's it's a lot. Um, and now you know I've I've got a little side gig that I do as well. So so I've added Sundays as my day to also kind of contribute to. Uh, to the show and, and get some additional research done and stuff. So it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort uh, that goes into these shows. So I, I hope that the people that do come and hang out at these shows enjoy them. Uh, I hope that new people that um, are looking for uh, socially, socially conscious, intelligent, uh, political comedy that's not just going to talk about how orange Trump is for an hour. Uh, you know, I hope you guys you guys will come check out the show as well and become regular viewers of the show. Um, so uh, this next one is August 28th. That's the last one for the summer, and then we're going to go into the fall and winter schedule. And I was thinking about it because of the amount of work that it that it's uh, that I have to do for these shows. Um, Basically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to three shows per month. Three shows per month. So three weeks out of every month, uh, you know, I'll be doing the schedule of, uh, you know, the research, the writing, the editing, the graphics.
graphics of them doing the show and having the presentation and all that. And then I'll have uh, maybe one, well, definitely one week, but maybe sometimes two weeks. I think January and October have five Fridays um, where I will essentially take two weeks off to recuperate, relax a little bit, um, get caught up on a few other projects that I'm working on. Uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of going to be, uh, the way that I, uh, approach this and I put this together, uh, so that way I'm not burning out, I'm not getting sick of the show, because I'll be honest, this week has been a little tough, because I do think I'm a little burned out, uh, but it's, it's pretty much been go mode for, you know, uh, since the Providence Print Festival, at least, it's been go mode and there really hasn't been a whole lot of breaks in between or if there have been there it's been more of like half a day here and there that I've taken a break um, while it, and then still gotten back to the regular work schedule that I do have and do have to like take care of and maintain so <clears throat> with this with this new way of doing it I'll have three shows a month Obviously, the sustaining members get free tickets for those shows. Um, they get they, you don't have to purchase a ticket if you don't want to. Um, if you are in a financial bind and you want to see the show, hit me up, send me a message. I will make sure that you have access to the show. Um, and then uh, one of the other things I've been doing since June, pretty much since the start of the show. Uh, is donating half the uh, half the ticket sales to a grassroots organization. Uh, you know, I, we've raised, been able to raise some money for organizations like the uh, Black Visions Collective in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Movement for a People's Party, Level Up, Pittsburgh Mutual Aid, Tidewater DSA. Oh, excuse me. Um, it's early when I'm recording this. Uh, you know, Hardland's Media Action for Assange. We've we've been able to donate to various different causes, and uh, and that's awesome. Uh, but it's becoming more and more difficult to find groups like this. Um, more more or less, it's not difficult to find them. I can find them. It's just getting a response from them that is uh, particularly difficult. And not only that. But because of the way that capitalism works, uh, that three-month grace period for uh, a variety of bills and such um, is coming to an end. So I do have more expenses to take care of uh, on my end. I've got a few life things that are changing as well. Um, So, you know, my financial responsibilities are... Um, increasing in that way and considering that I'm not touring the way that I am uh, where I could do 20 shows a month I'm pretty much down from doing you know roughly 20 shows a month down to three um, three regular shows and then on occasion if I jump onto somebody else's show so it's not it's not a lot and my income is still not back to what it needs to be Uh, so hence the side job and Hence, you know, uh, basically what I'm saying is I'm, I won't be donating to grassroots organizations because of the time commitment it takes to do the research and get a response and then coordinate with them. It's a lot of, it's a lot of additional effort that goes on to my part. And once again, I'm the only person uh, on staff uh, to do all this stuff, so it becomes really, really difficult. And with the increased financial commitments that I have, and these aren't like, you know, I'm saving up to go to Bali or whatever. It's like I need to pay for my car and my insurance uh, and cover my bills and get food and things of that sort. Um, you know, I'm. Uh, that's part of the reason why it's like I can't really donate right now. And I do feel shitty about it. Uh, and, uh, like, I was talking to a few people. I was talking to my sister. And my sister was like, you donated half your ticket sales to a bunch of organizations for, 
like three months when you weren't really making an income so uh maybe relax about it a little bit and it's, and it's like yeah I, I i understand but it's still uh you know it's something that i've wanted to be able to do uh for a long time with the, with my comedy and uh be able to kind of turn my comedy shows into um larger events larger kind of community building events um organizing events that sort of stuff so and it was kind of turning into that i think some people were you know turned on to new platforms new channels new new people like i i you know i think some more people got got wind of what a mutual aid is or what uh a movement for a people party really stands for and uh how we can break through the duopoly with these folks and you know how to help julian assange so and it and it makes me feel good because it's kind of the, like that's part of the reason why I decided to do this type of comedy in the first place. Um, so, with that being said, uh, I hope you guys will still come to the shows. I hope you guys will still support, uh, you know, my endeavors and all that. Uh, it, you know, I am still trying to make this whole virtual thing work, and it seems like it's going to become a little bit more permanent. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm completely supported financially by you guys, the people that watch these shows, the people that purchase tickets, download albums, um, you know, become sustaining members, make one-time donations and all that sort of stuff. That's primarily how I am, um, sustained and kept afloat so to speak uh i have other small sources of income here and there but you know the primary source of income has always been comedy and touring and performing and because that's not happening right now uh and i need to take care of some uh upcoming bills which i'll talk to i'll I'll talk about that maybe at a different time in, in regards to like what's going on because it's sort of a it's sort of a a bit of a uh up and down roller coaster type situation um and uh it's almost taken care of but not taken care of you know what i mean like it's just it's 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 uh, a story that is ongoing at the moment so i would i would much rather get to the end of this chapter of uh, you know, dealing with a fucking bank, uh, before I kind of put that out in the public, but anyway, uh, so those are kind of some of the changes, and another major change that I'm also making is looking for a new ticketing site, so if you follow me on social media, you're probably going to see a poll that's going to go up relatively soon after this video is posted, or maybe around the same time or before, I'm not really sure when this will happen, but I will be doing a poll, uh, sometime in the next, you know, day or so, um, because I'm looking for a new ticketing website. Uh, I've been using brown paper tickets for, gosh, years now, years, and, uh, you know, they've been pretty good about some stuff. I've had a couple of little kerfuffles here and there, and that's really all they are, is, uh, uh, I, I feel comfortable using the term kerfuffle uh, instead of like a fight or an argument or something like that because it's usually a minor thing and they fix it pretty quickly uh, and I've never really had to uh, worry about like refunding people or um, you know like not getting a check or how do I do this thing like they're pretty responsive or or they were pretty responsive and over the time of the quarantine you know I I, I had a lot of dates set up um, that fortunately like well fortunately and unfortunately uh, because because of the the time at which I set the ticketing up and because of when the show was happening um, you know, I 
people just stopped buying tickets once they heard that there is a global pandemic happening and like they need to stay inside and large gatherings were bad. Uh, so, you know, the, the shows from like mid March onwards, just nobody was buying tickets for them. And why would you, right? Like, it doesn't make any sense that you would. Um, so I just canceled those shows and I looked to try to reschedule them or whatever. And, uh, same thing happened with a bunch of Lee Camp shows. Um, I tour with Lee Camp. Some of you guys might know that. And, um, we had to cancel a bunch of the shows, but then we found out a couple weeks ago, actually, that the refunds weren't being sent out to the customers. Um, they were not, you know, running through the refunds for from their credit card processor or anything. So that was kind of weird. Not just that, but uh, doing these virtual shows, I found out that some people weren't getting emails um, in regards to like the login information for the show. And uh, that was a problem because I, uh, you know, that's kind of how I get people into see these shows. It's, and I don't want people to have a bad experience with that because, you know, if you have a bad experience with the ticketing company for one of my shows, it's still a, uh, people still view that as somehow it's on me, somehow it's on the artist. And, and they might not support an artist. And for somebody in my position that, you know, earlier in the year, I, I had people coming out to see me on purpose in a lot of different cities. And then that kind of came to a grinding halt. And it was like, okay, how do I kind of maintain a, a monicum of this momentum? Um, and it became these virtual shows. And when people started coming to these virtual shows, but then the ticketing platform becomes far more complicated and far more, uh, uh, far, far, or rather far less user intuitive, it still ends up looking as a black mark on me rather than the ticketing company. Uh, so, you know, we had to go through to try to figure out what's going on with that. And I'm talking to all these people like, hey, I know you're coming to the show, but can you answer a couple questions of like, you know, I, I became like ticket detective so to speak um, and that was a huge issue and now it's like the refunds are an issue I can't create new events I'm finding out that some people can't even get tickets the last two or three shows I've had a bunch of people that just directly PayPal me uh, because they can't get a ticket through brown paper tickets and that's all these are all big huge fucking red flags to me because it's just, it's just going to decrease the amount of people that are going to come see my shows. They don't have phone support anymore. I've emailed them a bunch of times, and they've completely been MIA. So I started looking for a new ticketing, um, ticketing company uh, because it's just like the, the problems are heightening with them. Anyway, uh, so I've narrowed it down to four. Uh, Ticket Leap, Yapsity, uh, Ticket Hub, and Purple Pass. Uh, I'm going to do a poll to, to see, you know, what people think, what would be the best thing for them. All of them have very similar um, uh, fees. No, nothing is too uh, over the top, you know, nothing more than a dollar. Between a dollar and two dollars is really all they're charging for, um, for their fees, which is... Uh, comparable to brown paper tickets, it's a lot less than Eventbrite. It's a lot less than, um, you know, uh, Ticketmaster and all of these other sort of like big name ticketing sites. Seat Engine, all that kind of shit. So, so look for those updates. Again, um, all of that is going to be uh, talked about on my website. Krishmohanhaha.com, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. Uh, okay, sorry, that was a very long intro, but I wanted to kind of get through some stuff and, uh, and um, talk. Those are, those are sort of some pretty major big updates coming in um, on my end, so I wanted to make sure I, I, uh, I addressed them while, uh, while I had them in my mind. So, uh, let's dump, jump into this story that we're going to talk about today, and uh, it involves, of course, 
uh, the DNC because the Democratic National Convention is going on this week. And, and quite honestly, um, I uh, did not realize that. <laughs> I knew it was in August. Like, I knew they'd moved it to sometime in August. I just, like, didn't know it was this week because I just didn't see anything about it. And, you know, I think we get obsessed with elections in this country because it's it's theater. That's, that's, how, it's, that's how it's really taken in, the, in, this, in this country is uh, electoral politics are theater. Hence why, uh, hence why and also why it's theater is because there's so much money involved no different than a Hollywood production. That's all it is. It's just a production that kind of involves the leadership of this country, that kind of involves the, uh, you know, what happens to our health care and how our roads are taken care of. It's all entertainment, really, is is sort of the way that they take it. Um, So is it because, because, you know, we have so much fraud and interference and really it's, 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 a reality show in and of itself. Are we surprised that in 2016 a reality show host fucking won? No, I kind of think it's like the most accurate viewpoint of what the American election system is and what both the DNC and the RNC have turned it into. It's theater. It's not about policy. It's not about legislating for the people. It's not about upholding the fucking Constitution. It's about feel-goodery. That's kind of what the Democratic National Convention really is. There's a lot of feel-goody talk. I've seen some stuff, right? And then there's, like, arbitrary moments of, like, really intense drama and, like, gotcha moments, you know? Like, uh... Like, how solving a fucking medical case. Uh, And it's really, it's just like, what a twist! You know, you have those moments as well. I I mean, I haven't watched all the speeches. I I watched the one that I'm going to talk about here in a a minute, uh, which is Obama's speech. But, you know, I've watched clips here and there. It's like Michelle Obama wants to talk about empathy and walking in other people's shoes. And it's just like, what... Whose shoes have you walked in? Have you walked in the shoes of people that voted for Barack Obama, your husband, and went for uh, fucking eight years were just incredibly disappointed the whole time? All the lofty promises, all the all the fighting for the people, all the hope and the change that he promised. Are you walking in their shoes, or are you just telling them to shut the fuck up, bend at the knee, and vote for the party? Because that's really all I hear from party elites in, in the Democratic, uh, from the Democratic Party. Bend the knee and vote for the party. We have Kamala Harris talking about justice and equality, and it's just like, are you serious? Look at your fucking record. Your record is one of the worst when it comes to criminal justice reform. You put single moms in prison for for kids not going to school and never bothered to ask why these kids don't feel comfortable going to school. You laughed at a man on death row. Your your department uh, was so incompetent that it lost evidence and then you couldn't take responsibility for it. You're, You're like the poster child for the prison industrial complex and you're talking about equality and justice like it these are just platitudes no one's really talking about what their policies are going to be coming out and just saying well black lives matter isn't enough when you don't legislate in accordance with that so it's just theater, right? And then we had Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez nominating Bernie Sanders. It was like, whoa, what a twist. What a gotcha. It's like, yeah, you gave her an Instagram video amount of time to make a speech while you have people like John Kasich getting headline spots. Michelle Obama got a headline spot. You don't want the rising stars of the Democratic Party to fucking say something? What Pramila Jayapal? Why didn't you get her to say some stuff? Susan Sarandon didn't get to say anything. 
Killer Mike. You could have gotten Killer Mike to come up and say some shit at the Democratic National. But these are all Bernie people. Right? Joe Rogan's had more Democrats uh, on his fucking thing than uh, MSNBC has. Could have invited Joe Rogan. But he supported Tulsi Gabbard, Andrew Yang, and, and Bernie Sanders. Even fucking Bernie went on and, and talked about shit. Again, I didn't, I didn't get to see Bernie's speech. I really should. I might. I'll, I'll see if I have time to do that this weekend and maybe talk about it. Uh, but j- just the mere fact that he's going along with this party that has fucked him over twice now. is just, like, unfathomable to me. But it's good theater. It's really, really good fucking theater, right? It's a good show. It's a good performance. And a lot of these politics uh, or politicians uh, are doing that. They're, they're performing for you guys. They're not legislating. I mean, it's just like, look at, look at, look at the last four years alone. Not to mention what the fuck the Republicans did during the Obama administration. Like fucking John Boehner crying. Theater. Nancy Pelosi ripping up Trump's State of the Union speech. Theater. Kamala Harris pretending she has emotions. Theater. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez nominating Bernie Sanders. It's cool, but it's theater. So is it a wonder that when we fund it like it's a fucking Hollywood movie where there's a couple people, the executive producers, the studios, if you will, that put money into these candidates into these campaigns, these major productions that they are. Is it any wonder that the President of the United States right now, starting in 2016, wound up being a reality TV star? It's not. So let's get into Obama's speech. Let's get into Obama's speech. I watched the whole thing, top to bottom. I watched the whole thing. Um, and it's fine. You know, it's it's an Obama speech. <laughs> you know, it's just like liberals are fucking fawning over it. They're like, it's the greatest speech we've ever seen. Nobody's ever had a greater speech. In the, Like, really? No, Malcolm X. Bobby Newton, Fred Hampton, MLK. Nobody's had a better speech than him. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure Joaquin Phoenix had a more emotional speech at, at, you know, whatever award ceremony he was at. Golden Globes, something? Yeah. I've literally seen rappers have more of an emotional speech than the speech that Obama did at the DNC. Like, what the fuck are you talking? It's just the most, it was so stirring and emotional and what a plea. It's just like, I was not convinced to vote for the Democratic Party at all after his speech. If that was the goal of, the, of, of Obama's speech to begin with. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I just know too much about, you know, this duopoly. And I'm just like, I don't, I, like, what do I do with this? So whenever I watch this and have people and people just go, he's so brave and strong to come out and talk shit on Donald Trump as the president. It's just like, okay. So, so he basically did the same thing that late night television comedians have been doing for four years, but like less funny. <laughs> That's what he did. Open mic comics have been 
talking shit on Donald Trump for four years. But again, Obama's speech arguably maybe was less funny. You could make an argument that Obama's speech was actually funnier than open mic comics, but there was no emotion. There, This wasn't like a stirring speech. It was a standard, typical Obama speech. It, it kind of felt like he was giving like a graduation speech. So, the beginning at the top of it, he talks about what a president should be, right? He talks about what a president should be, that they're the custodian of democracy, and they're there to protect and preserve and defend the freedoms of all of the all of the people, including the people that have fought and died to protect, preserve, and defend our freedoms. And this is coming from a man who invoked the Espionage Act more than any president in modern history, who waged a unending war on whistleblowers, people that are defending the country by pointing out government atrocities, by pointing out government misdeeds, exiled a person like Edward Snowden in Russia to build some bullshit narrative of McCarthyism, demonized someone like Julian Assange, who pointed out war crimes, then put Chelsea Manning in jail and only commuted her sentence because pardoning her would have been a sign to the elites that he's no longer on their side, would have been a sign to the uh, military industrial complex that he's no longer on their side and he needs to have these people on their side that's that's who he, that's who he's defending about the dapple protesters under Obama the dapple protesters were attacked by the militarized police using water and sound cannons That was all under his administration. These are people protecting their their freedoms. They're, these are people protecting their uh, their their constitutional rights, ensuring that those rights are defended. He didn't do anything for them. He just kind of let that shit happen. In fact, in certain cases, especially the whistleblowers, he went out of his way, out of his way, to attack them. So you weren't the custodian of democracy when you were a president, but you're holding somebody else to that standard, a standard that you you were setting but not living up to, and then not accepting that you live up to. That doesn't seem fair. So then he goes on to criticize Trump, right? He criticized Trump for helping himself. Uh, and enriching other people around him. And this is coming from the man who let Citibank pick his cabinet and then got half a million dollars to go speak at these banks when he left office. That's what he did. 2017, 2018, he got paid $600,000 to go speak at Wall Street, at Goldman Sachs, at Citibank, at J.P. Morgan Chase. Why would you do that? Why would you get money from them? If you were championing for the people. Oh, is it because you bailed them out in 08? And this is how they're going to reward you for it? Oh, and then he talks about how the top take more. Right? Like... He talks about income inequality, how there, there's a, 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 a uh, 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 top-heavy distribution of wealth. It's like, yeah, that was happening under you too, dude. Wait, do you, do you just think like in 2016, all of a sudden we started giving billionaires a, a, like a bunch of breaks? Did you not pay attention to anything fucking Bernie Sanders was saying? During, during his campaign in 2015. 
Tax breaks to billionaires have been going on for a very long time. I've addressed this in my show, um, and I've addressed this, uh, like, if you come see me perform at Fringe, uh, or, or something along those lines, um, you know, I, um, I have addressed this exact thing, uh, where billionaires have increased their wealth by 1,100% since 1980. 1,100%. Collectively, not not just each individual. Like, collectively, uh, billionaires, a small group of people, have made 1,100 times more money since 1980. And that means that that just didn't happen overnight in, in 2016. Like, it wasn't like November 9th, 2016. It was just like billionaires just got a shit ton more money. It happened because you fucking bail out banks. It happens because you let the uh, insurance companies determine what health care should be. It happens because Jeff Bezos gets to legally hide his money wherever the fuck he wants and gets tax breaks for doing so. It happens because they don't pay their fucking employees properly. And you didn't raise minimum wage under your administration. You didn't talk about uh, improving conditions for people that, that lose their jobs. You didn't put financial protections in place. You didn't put these safety nets. You can sit there and say, oh, well, Republicans, Republicans, Republicans. But Trump has gotten a bunch of shit done with Democratic opposition. How does that not show that the Democrats are just kind of fucking spineless? They're not the resistance. And the only people that are within the Democratic Party, speaking out against the military-industrial complex, speaking out for Medicare for all, for a universal basic income, to treat people that have lost their jobs, unfortunately, with dignity and with respect, they get shunned out. Look at the way, per, like, Pramila Jaipal is treated. Or look at the way Bernie was treated. Look at the way AOC is talked about. Even though AOC toes the line, the squad... Tulsi Gabbard, look what happened to her. So after he criticizes Trump, Obama starts talking about Biden, right? He calls him, he calls him a friend. Does the, he does the Bernie Sanders thing. My friend Joe Biden, look, here's what my friend Joe Biden doesn't know. Here's what my, my, my friend Joe Biden, hey, Bernie did that a whole bunch. That's what Obama did. He did the whole my friend Joe Biden thing. And then he calls him a brother. Just like, what? <laughs> All right. That's fine, I guess. You do know your brother put a bunch of black people in prison, right? Create, it was the architect behind the prison industrial complex, the modern prison industrial complex. That's your brother putting people that look like you in prison more than people that look like him for the same crimes. Dude, if I had a brother that was the architect behind the modern prison industrial complex, I'd be fucking pissed. I, I, would, I would probably come very close to, like, disowning that person or at least be like, you, you have something to atone for, and if you're unwilling to atone for it, which Joe Biden isn't, because every time you bring up his record, he kind of freaks the fuck out uh, and starts yelling and says crazy shit like the NAACP has endorsed him when the NAACP doesn't endorse political candidates Um, I would probably be like if you don't atone for it then I like I don't think we can be family anymore like we can be family but we're not gonna be family you know what I mean calls him reliable he has he has reliance like he's he's he can rely on Joe which, sure, I mean, I guess if you're going to bail out banks, who else are you going to go to? It says he has a lot of empathy. Just, just like, are you just not watching fucking Joe Biden talk to people? Anytime his record's brought up, anytime his mental health is brought up, he loses his shit. It's like, yeah, bro, I think people are trying to fucking help you. 
Do you guys remember when Donald Trump didn't want to take a fucking mental exam? How is Joe Biden yelling at the press about his mental health than forgetting words any different than that? I remember, I believe it was 2018, I think it was in Philadelphia when this happened, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine when I did the a Fringe Festival there. Maybe it, was, maybe it was late 2017. And we had this conversation about him taking a, uh, a test, right? The, the psychological test to see if he's mentally fit for the job. Remember that conversation being part of, the, part of the dialogue. And, you know, my friend who is in the uh, therapy world said that because he has a personality disorder, it's very difficult to uh, figure that information out. And it made sense. And it made sense, right? It made total sense. And, uh... And, I mean, every liberal was just, like, making fun of him for not taking this test. They chastised him for not taking this test. With Joe Biden, it's the exact opposite. It becomes this major, like, viral thing that he freaks out about his mental health. And then every liberal is like, shh, 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 don't bring, How are we not going to bring it up? The dude forgets words. The dude says random shit. The dude loses his train of thought all the time. But again, people just sit there and go, well, we're not voting for Joe. We're voting for fucking Kamala Harris, who's just as bad as Joe Biden in her record. She has an opportunity to atone for those things, but my my wager is that she won't. My wager is because who I know who her donors are, which is Hillary Clinton, I know that she's tied with Biden, another top-tier Democrat. She ain't going to atone for shit. Oh, we're voting for Supreme Court justices. You mean the justices that have never done anything real about women's cho- uh, like being pro-choice? Women's health care choices? Roe versus Wade is a privacy issue, and it's relegated down to states. That's what liberals do. We saw what happens when you leave things down to the states last year. How many states put archaic abortion bills in place? And if you really want to vote for the Supreme Court, if you really want to vote for the vice president, a vice presidential pick, then we should, right? Like that should be a part of uh, the nominating process. That should be part of the electoral process. Who do we think is going to pair with, you know, who or whatever? Like, if the if the fucking election process is going to be this two-year fucking reality TV show, you know, that we do every time there's a president, yeah, then we should elect a vice president, and we should elect a president, and we should elect Supreme Court justices, and they should all campaign for it, just like everything else that everybody else does. Then it makes sense that this is a two-year-long process that leads to, you know, essentially the season finale of the campaigning process. Said he made him a better president. That's what that's what Barack Obama said. He made him a better president. Uh, and he respects and cherishes Joe. He was always the last one to leave. And he took his advice, you know, when he was stuck on a problem. That's what Barack Obama said about Joe Biden. And here's the thing. That is kind of a crock of shit. And here's why. It's kind of a crock of shit. Uh, because in 2019, Obama didn't come out and just endorse Joe Biden. He didn't come out and endorse anybody. He he talked to a bunch of people, right? Uh, there were um, he he had like an open conference invitation or some shit like that, where you could go and get advice from Obama about the presidential campaign. And a bunch of people did because, at the end of the day, they knew that as it got closer to things like Super Tuesday uh, or Iowa, uh, a major bump 
putting his finger on the scale, so to speak. If Obama did that for any of those candidates, uh, that's it. The deal is sealed. Their their numbers are probably going to skyrocket much higher than they were before. So uh, Mayor Pete went and met with Obama. Kamala Harris met with Obama. Uh, virtually, I think almost every single Democratic candidate did. Well, and then he didn't feel like he needed to meet with Biden because he knew Biden. So uh, Biden felt kind of stumped, you know, stiff about that. Uh, but Bernie didn't meet with Obama. Tulsi Gabbard didn't meet with Obama. Uh, Andrew Yang, Mary Ann Williamson. So basically, like, the outsider Democratic candidates didn't meet with Obama. Probably, I mean, I don't think Bloomberg met with Obama, but uh, Bloomberg got in super late in the game and they changed all the rules for him anyway. So not just that, though. It, he made statements. He made statements about Joe Biden uh, because everybody's like, oh, I bet you're going to endorse Joe Biden because he was your VP. And he was like, no, he's got to earn it. Biden's got to earn my endorsement, just like everybody else does. So that sourpuss Joe Biden because, again, Joe Biden, just like Hillary Clinton, feels very entitled to the office of the presidency. He feels incredibly entitled to that office. Uh, and I think, again, there are a lot of voters that see that kind of shit and they don't like it. And you can see that in the way that he kind of reacted to Obama saying that he's got to earn that endorsement. Uh, you know, so he got mad. There was a rift between the Obama and the Biden camps. Uh, he was like, waiting for that and then I guess the endor I guess I guess Biden got the endorsement from Obama um, around the time that Bernie was winning and he was like oh shit I better try to say something because that was something that they were they were going to do anyway and they made a lot of statements about you know uh, Bernie and saying like oh well if Bernie's going to run away with the election meaning if the people really want Bernie Sanders to be the Democratic nominee for the president of the United States the former president of the United States will step in and try to convince voters not to vote for Bernie Sanders, who objectively is the peak person that a lot of Americans wanted. And you can argue with me all you want, but the exit poll data basically shows that Bernie Sanders would have won far more states had the election not been rigged by the DNC against Bernie Sanders some shit that they do all the time. Uh, recently, Obama said this. Recently, Obama said this. And this is, this is, I'm not getting this from like, you know, the gray zone or something, which is a trusted news source, but I'm getting this from like corporate media, mainstream media. Business Insider has reported this. Politico has reported this. These are all corporate mainstream media outlets. Right, like that, that neoliberals love to quote all the time. Politico and Business Insider have reported that just recently Obama came out and spoke out against Biden. Recently. He said, don't underestimate Joe's ability to fuck this all up. They obviously bleeped out the word, but I'm a comedian and I, you know, who gives a shit? He doesn't believe that, that uh, you know, Joe has an intimate connection with the electorate. And I don't think he does. Tell me who, and leave a comment with this information. If you're watching this video and you're a Joe Biden supporter and you're a staunch Democrat and anything, tell me what about Joe Biden you're excited about. Not that he's going to defeat Trump. Not that he's not Donald Trump. That's not, that's not telling me what about Joe Biden you're excited about. I want to know specifically what about his campaign, his policies, his personality are you excited about? Based on everything I've mentioned in this video, based on what people can view with their own eyes and have viewed with their own eyes, the horrible way he dealt with Tara Reid's allegations, the horrible way he dealt with uh, Charlemagne the God, his reaction to that, the shit that he says, black people aren't diverse, but Latino people are like, what? 
based on uh, what are you excited about with Joe Biden? Not what are you unexcited about Trump for, but what are you excited about Joe Biden? Give me a reason to vote for Joe Biden, not against Donald Trump. If you have an answer, leave a comment. If you don't, I, I mean, you know, kind of secures the answer. And I don't think he really has an intimate connection with the electorate. Donald Trump does with his with his side. I don't like the guy. I'm not going to fucking vote for the guy. But the hardcore Trumpers, he's got a connection with them. There's a personality there, you know, like... He wants to do a bunch of crazy stuff. There's a there's a connection between the between his electorate and him. I don't really see it with Joe Biden. I don't really see it with Joe Biden. When I was touring around the country a lot more, I never saw Biden signs. I saw a lot of Bernie signs. I saw a lot of Tulsi signs. I saw a shit ton of Yang signs and Marion Williamson signs. Every so often I'd see a Warren sign. Every so often I'd see a Mayor Pete sign. And every so often I would see a Kamala Harris sign. Never a Joe Biden sign. So what are people actually excited about when it comes to Joe Biden? Other than the fact that he's not Trump. That one doesn't count because that to me is not voting for somebody. That's voting against somebody. Look, I'm divorced, right? And uh, I'm dating somebody right now. And when somebody asks me uh, what I like about my girlfriend, I can't just be like, well, she's not my ex-wife. That can't be the only fucking reason for it. Right? Like, my reasons are she's awesome. She's beautiful. She's super nice. She's super kind. She's super nerdy and we like to watch the same thing. I have a shit ton of fun with her when I'm around her all the time. You know? Like, she's a great cook. She makes awesome drinks. And I feel good when I'm around her. She brings me up instead of brings me down where we're, we have a good partnership like there's a lot of reasons why I'm with this person that's not the fact that this person is not this other person David Axelrod who is one of Obama's advisors who's the uh, guy that did that I think no 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 that's a different guy sorry David Axelrod is one of Obama's major advisors uh, said Joe Biden has a Mr. Magoo quality These are top-tier fucking Democratic uh, politicians and advisors that are making fun of Joe Biden, that don't believe in Joe Biden. But they're going to push him to be the president of the United States, despite what the people really wanted. Because the guy that the people really wanted was going to fuck over their corporate donors. And Obama didn't really endorse Joe Biden until he had the nomination anyway. So we go on and Obama starts talking about, uh, what is he talking about? Concrete policies that he has. Then he like doesn't mention any of the policies that Joe Biden actually has. He starts talking about his policies. Like he starts talking about the ACA, which still left millions of people without health care. He started talking about uh, the uh, Restoration Act or something. Um, I can't remember exactly what it's called. Basically, what happened after the housing crash. It's just like, wait, you mean the time that you bailed out the banks and not the people? You you mean the time that 10 million people lost their homes? You mean the thing that we're going to repeat again but worse? You're bragging about that? (laughs) Also, what's Joe Biden's plan to take care of that? Fucking nothing. He's going to bail out the banks again. mentions the military but doesn't mention the drone war or the kill list that he had that Joe Biden was also a part of Daniel Everett Hale revealed a kill list that was part of the drone papers where's Daniel Everett Hale well thanks to Obama handing over the dictator's toolkit to Donald Trump Daniel Everett Hale is in prison right now for being a whistleblower because remember Obama hates whistleblowers
And then he starts talking about how people are going to make it harder to vote because voting is so important. And, he, and, he, and it's just like he pretends like the DNC didn't fuck over the electorate. What? Bro, the DNC actively fucked over Bernie Sanders' campaign, Tulsi Gabbard's campaign, Andrew Yang's campaign. Like, how are you just going to ignore that shit? How are you going to ignore election fraud from the Democrats and just say Republicans in Russia? The two, the two R's that you use as a scapegoat. It's a 19-minute speech. This is a 19-minute speech. And in that 19 minutes, everybody's claiming this is an emotional. It wasn't that emotional. It's a pretty standard speech. Riddled, riddled with hypocrisy. Riddled with it. A 19-minute speech that was not emotional, riddled with hypocrisy, essentially lying to progressives, lying to everybody about the party and about the candidates. But it's good theater. It's very, very good theater. And everybody's talking about it now, right? Like, pundits, comedians. I see videos popping up all over the place about, oh, Obama's emotional plea to the Democratic electorate. Almost like they have a coordinated effort to fucking spin it to be like, it's an emotional plea. Look how emotional. He's just so sad. Here's the thing that they don't think about that none of these presidential candidates really think about, right, is um, whatever they do during their presidency is going to affect the following ones. So what happens when someone gets into office that doesn't believe the same things you do? Do you have protective measures put into place on your policies so that if someone with the exact opposite views as you do comes in and wants to dismantle certain things that provide protections and safety nets for the populace. Is there is there some protections in place? And the answer to, to what Obama did was no. Mass surveillance, increased drone warfare, more drilling in the Arctic, more immigrant deportations, the creation of ICE, the creation of the immigrant detention centers. He figured all of that was going to go to Hillary Clinton. Two to seven wars. Two wars to seven wars. All of that would go to Hillary Clinton. Well, it didn't. It went to Donald Trump. Because, because the Democrats were cocky, even though... Because they got so used to lying to the people so much and, and convincing them to be complacent and thinking, well, they are the party of morality and logic through their corporate malfeasance that it's never going to go to a Republican. And then it did. And did he come out and say anything? Hey, I fucked up. I should have been better about my surveillance. I should have been better about my increased drone war. I should have... Uh, put some protections in place so that, you know, more people don't die. Should have made it harder for someone to repeal things that I put into place. I goofed up. No. He just... He, Trump did what Trump did. Americans don't think about that. The leadership doesn't think about that. The consequences of what's going to happen when a leader is put into place that has fundamentally opposite viewpoints as you do. And and here's the reality of it. They don't. Not when they're giving to corporate donors. Not when they only care about corporations. At that point, they don't really give a shit. If that is, if, if 
we're not living in a democracy. We're living in a kleptocracy. We're living in a corporatocracy. And both parties participate in that. That's why both parties don't need to put protections in place. That's why Obama commuted Chelsea Manning's sentence instead of pardoning her. That's why it's so easy to dismantle social safety nets, but a lot harder to put into place things like taxing billionaires. Because when it comes to protecting corporations, both parties are guilty of it. Both parties will make these grand platitudinal fucking speeches filled with hypocrisy. This is like a dramatic moment in a movie. And that's really all it is. This isn't an emotional plea to vote for the Democratic Party. This isn't them saying things will be better that we're, we're going to, you know, roll the clocks back and, and we are going to start moving forward and we've learned from our past mistakes under the Obama administration and we're going to listen to progressives and work with uh, the, the progressive caucuses and uh, listen to the electorate and really implement uh, things that are going to help the working class. This isn't that. This is that moment when you hear a big, great speech in a movie you're supposed to feel loved. That's all this is. It's nothing but good theater. All right, folks, that's the end of the road reflection there. Uh, if you guys enjoyed it, there are multiple ways to help uh, all of my shows. The first and foremost being hitting the like button, hitting the share button, and making sure you are subscribed to uh, the channel that you are watching this on, whether you are watching this on the YouTubes, whether you are watching this on uh, Facebook or uh, on my brand new Rockfin channel. Uh, Rockfin is the uh, blockchain cryptocurrency site that kind of acts like Netflix for political commentators. Uh, so if you like my stuff or Graham Elwood, Kim Iverson, Nico House, Ron Falcone, Jimmy Dore, uh, if you become a subscriber, you get all of the premium content that we put out. Uh, for being a subscriber. So it works on that freemium model. Uh, Rockfin is a platform that is specifically help, uh, meant to help people earn money off of their content just by you watching our content. So uh, there's that. Uh, you can become a sustaining member. Uh, you can make a one-time donation. Uh, you can download my album. You can come see a live virtual stand-up comedy show. All of those things uh, are ways that you can help out. And all of the details for uh, all of those things are available directly on my website, which is krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, thank you guys to, uh, to the people that have already subscribed, to the people that are sustaining members, that share, like, watch, uh, that come to these vir live virtual events. It really means a lot to me that you guys do that. Uh, but till the next one, thanks for getting into it, and we'll see you on the road.